this morning and turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 20. Genesis, chapter 20. While you're turning there, <clears throat> let me ask you some questions. Have you ever done something that maybe wasn't the brightest action? Or made a decision that in hindsight didn't demonstrate the most logically, logically coherent thought process, and yet somehow it seemed to work out okay? It was if God stepped in and fixed the failure. Maybe he had a situation occur and didn't fully investigate the ramifications and found God had preserved you from a potentially disastrous outcome. I know I have. <clears throat> Shortly after we bought our pickup, I don't know if you remember, we were going to Oklahoma City for an appointment, and we were on the ramp turning on to 235 there, and, and uh, we got rear-ended. And so after, after checking on the young lady that, that hit us and everything, I, I looked over the truck, saw the damage, saw it was drivable, and so we went on about our business. And a day or two later, Brother Jay and I, we went and picked up a trailer, a U-Haul trailer, and we came and loaded all the camp sound and video equipment and hauled it up to Binger and set it all up, and then we came back home and dropped the trailer and and because uh, that was a year I couldn't go, so we just set up and then came back and I dropped off the trailer back to U-Haul. We went on about our business, and we were up here in the parking lot, and Brother Paul drove up. And he was looking at the damage to the truck, and as he was looking, he said, do you not have a, a wiring harness for, you know, the trailer? I said, oh, yeah, I do. And as I bent down to show him where my harness was actually mounted on my trailer hitch on the bar, it's when I noticed my hitch pin hanging in a real odd position. And that's when it dawned on me that when I got rear-ended, it sheared my hitch pin. So instead of going all the way through the receiver, it was just hanging on one side. We had pulled a trailer loaded with literally thousands and thousands of dollars of video and, and production equipment all the way to Binger down that dirt and gravel road, bouncing all over the place, brought the, can brought the trailer back the same way and dropped it off and never knew it. I looked at Brother Paul and I said, you know the old saying, the Lord looks after fools and drunks? <laughs> I don't drink. <laughs> Not everything works out so well in the whole uh, and, and the whole God looks at your fools and drunks is, is really just homespun foolishness. But there is, however, something to be said for God's provision. He does protect us from ourselves um, many times when we have made decisions or take actions that are not well thought out. Uh, but that is not always the case. And it's one thing to act or make a decision thinking we know that we have everything that we need to decide, even though we, we really don't or we miss something that, that should be obvious. Uh, but in our humanity, we miss that. And, and, it's in, and, and it, so you know, we miss that at the same time. But it's also an entirely different matter when we go through life expecting God just to compensate, just to protect us, just to keep us from doing things. Um, and and we, we want him to compensate for our lack of forethought. I've said for years since I've been here, I will continue to say, life is cerebral. If you want to have a good life, it requires us honoring God and doing the things he wants us to do. And within that, it requires us to have a conscious thought process. We have to think about what we're doing. We have to think about what it means to honor God, to serve God. We have to read. We have to apply what he tells us. We have to use this brain. We can go through life like a pinball and whatever flipper hit us last, that's the direction we're heading. Or we can go through life thinking about what life is and trusting God to make up for that which we cannot see or know, but to do our part to honor God, to follow God, to think through our life and, and to do things in accordance with what he would have us to do. Sometimes we... we We try to do things our own way, and we expect God to kind of fix that. And sometimes we find ourselves partially in both sides of that. We, we find ourselves wanting to follow God, but not fully trusting in his ability um, to navigate life for us. 
uh, to protect us from those around us. We become impatient, waiting for God to answer our prayers, and we don't, we, we don't truly believe God can do what he says he will do. And I find this is really true in Christianity t- a lot. We, we, we believe, we get saved, we trust, we trust Christ for salvation, but we don't really believe the totality of Scripture, that God really can navigate our life for us. And if we'll give it to Him and let Him do it, we will live a much better life. Or that He can do <clears throat> all the things that He says He was. And, and this is where, when we, when we do this, when we, we become impatient, we start trying to help God out. We start trying to figure out ways that we can kind of help God get to where we want Him to be instead of waiting on God to direct us where He wants us to be and let Him do what He's going to do in His timing. When we do that, we create a mess. But God happens. Many times, God steps in our mess and prevents the worst from happening. But it's important that we understand He seldom removes the consequences. He may prevent the worst, but we still have consequences that we're going to face. We pick up in Genesis 20, and we see in our But God series, Abraham has already made one critical error when he went along with Sarah on the whole, here, take my handmaid, and, and, uh, because there's no way God can give us a child uh, debacle. And now we see him once again having trouble trusting God. So we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and he dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now, Father, you know what you want us to get out of this, and, and you know all the things are going on in our lives, they're going on in our minds. In my mind, Father, you know the, the jumbled mess up there, but Father, you are God, and you can do what you desire, and we ask that you would have total control here, that you would bless the reading of your word, and that you would guide the preaching of your word, and that you would just help me to be totally surrendered to you, to speak the things you've laid on my heart that you want us to hear. And Father, that we'll gain some insight to you and how you step in and how, how this idea of but God, no matter what's going on, but God, you are the king, you are the creator, and you have a way. We would be wise to follow that way and to trust your way. So, Father, you teach us what you want today, and, and I pray, Father, that you just take my will, that you'd use me the way you desire. I surrender to you. You do what you want. Father, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here, Abraham's fear and his lack of trust has now cost him his wife. Now remember, he has been called away from his family and told to go sojourn in a land that God is going to give him. And he's told him it's not going to happen just yet. The sin of the Amorite is not yet full, so I'm going to, I want you to wander around. I want you to walk through the length and the breadth, and, and I'm going to show you all the land that your seed after you is going to possess. So he's on this journey. He is just going from place to place, and he's scoping out the land, and he's seeing what God is going to give him. And so he's gotten over here by Kadesh, and, and so they get into this country, and so now he's told Abimelech, the king, that his wife is his sister. And she takes him. Uh, he takes her. So now his fear, his lack of trust, has cost him his wife. And notice his half-truth is a whole lie. And we're going to see later, he was telling the truth that she is his sister. And we're going to see the detail of that. But I want you to keep in mind, a half-truth is always a whole lie. And a lie of omission is still a lie. And young people, you need to understand this. When you're asked, did, I, did you do your homework? And you did part of it, and you say yes, and you leave out the part that you didn't finish your homework, that is half of a truth, but it is a whole lie. And a lie is a lie is a lie. And while we as adults through the years have made foolish decisions by trying to, trying to soften the blow for our kids and made up this idea, well, there's, there's a little white lie. It, it was a lie, but it was intended to help somebody. It wasn't intended to be harmful. A lie is a lie. It doesn't matter how we want to phrase it, how we want to mold it. A lie is a lie. And it's better just to not speak than to tell a lie. Well, does this dress look good on me? First of all, if it's not your wife, don't answer. 
Run. If it's your wife, consider your relationship. Maybe all that matters is, do you like that? Our one preacher say, after 40-something years of marriage or nearly 50 years of marriage, says, I finally learned it when my wife says, does this dress make me look fat? The answer is not, no, baby, I think it's your thighs. <laughs> so be cautious, guys, when you hear those questions. But really and truly, speak truth. Speak the truth in love. Be honest. You know, it's okay when people ask you questions for you to say, you know, that's not typically a question I answer. There's some personal things in my life I just don't readily answer and go on, or I'm just, you know what, that's not something I answer. I don't answer certain things. I know you don't believe that the way I talk, but really and truly, there are certain things I don't answer. There are certain things I let go, and it's okay to do that. It's better to do that than to lie. Well, I'm just trying to make them feel better, not if you're lying. You're not accomplishing anything, because how many of you can pretty much recognize a lie when it's told to you? So, you know, when somebody does a white lie, and then that really conflict more well what else are you hiding you really don't believe that it just creates a nightmare so he's told half of a truth but it is a whole lie and it is a dangerous deal so here abraham is lied to the king of gerar uh, and and he, <laughs> it's gotten ugly but god happened Abraham is lied, but God happened. Look in verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou, also, uh, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said she not unto me? She, he, said he not unto me? She is my sister. And even she said, herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, innocency of my hands, have I done this? So here we see Abraham not trusting God, not having confidence that God will preserve him. Remember, Abraham is walking with a promise that God has made to him that he and his wife will have a son that is the promised seed that the great nation of Israel will one day be made from. Why should he be scared that something will happen to him or his wife? God has given him his word that this is going to take place. And it hasn't happened yet. Why is he so scared? Why is he so paranoid? Why can he not just trust God? He trusted God. He believed God. He was counted unto him for righteousness. He trusted him enough that he packed up his family and everything he owns. And, he, and he's not living in a nice adobe house somewhere. He's living in a tent, scoping out the promised land. But he can't believe God on this part. So he's scared to death. Somebody's going to take his wife and kill him for her. And so he, he says, just tell him you're my sister. Like nothing bad is going to happen in that scenario. You're living in a day when it is common to take multiple wives. Abimelech had a wife already. And here is this beautiful woman. And Abimelech sees her and says, well, who's this? Well, this is my sister. Hello? Add to the family. Another wife would be great. And so he takes her. And Abraham doesn't say a word. What is wrong with this man? He doesn't say a word. But God comes and tells Abimelech, God happens. He says, Abimelech, listen, he comes to him in the night by a dream, and he says, you touch this woman, you're a dead man. She belongs to somebody else, she's another man's wife. And Abimelech immediately starts saying, I did this in innocency. Didn't he say, this is my sister? Didn't she say, this is my, he's my brother? I did not do this from maliciousness. I, I did not do this. I did this. He says, in the integrity of his heart, in the innocency of my hands, have I done this? God comes back. God reassures Abimelech, but make sure he understands the, the depth of this. In verse 6, he said, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart. Notice he does not say in innocency. In the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So now God comes. He's intervened. God has happened. He's told Abimelech, 
Don't touch her. She's another man's wife. I will kill you if you sin against me. So he tells him now, he says, listen, let me reassure you, I understand. I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, that you were not trying to do something subversive. He did not, though, say that it was an innocency. Because even back then, multiple wives, though it may have been a culture, was not recommended. And everybody who had them had a nightmare. And we've got some examples of that, do we not? Abraham and multiple wives, that didn't do well. Solomon and multiple wives, that didn't go well. Jacob had multiple wives, that didn't go well. So guys, just in case you're thinking, boy, if we could just live in that culture, I could have more than one wife. It's not going to go well. Just read the Bible. It never has and it never will. So he tells you, so you restore her. I have prevented you from doing this. I have prevented you from sinning against me. So now you know the story. Go restore the man his wife. He's a prophet. Go restore his wife. If you don't, you're going to surely die. But notice also, as God happens here, God's rebuke on Abraham. In verse 8, he says, Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and, and I don't know about you, but if God came to me by night and said that what I'm about to do will cost me my life and everybody I love and know, I would get up in the morning early to go fix it too. So he got up early, rose up in the morning, called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, so now everybody knows, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Now, it's one thing when God rebukes you, but it's a, a higher embarrassment when he uses the world to rebuke you. When he uses those that aren't his to do the rebuke. This is embarrassing. Abraham has been found out. God's called him on a carpet. And he's used Abimelech, who Abraham perceives as not a man of God, who's not in a country that is godly, at least by his, his estimation. And he's being rebuked. And this is not the first time this has happened, by the way. You would think... He would learn after the first time, because if you go back to Genesis 12, remember, he's sojourning into Pharaoh, sees his wife, and she's pretty, and, and he says, this is my sister, and Pharaoh in his land gets plagued. This isn't the first time this has happened to him. This isn't the first time he's been called out by those which do not call upon the name of God. This is the second time that he has been rebuked by God through someone who is not, quote, a follower of Jehovah God. And now Abraham is forced to confess. He's forced to confess in front of everybody. In verse 11, he said, And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God calls me to wander from my father's house, that I send to her, this is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me at every place, whether we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. You know, this is pretty amazing when you just sit and ponder this whole scenario. Remember, this is just before she is going to become pregnant with Isaac. She's nearly 90 years old. And she is still so beautiful, she is sought after. And Abraham is paranoid because of her beauty that somebody will just take her and kill him. And that way they're free to do whatever. But still the issue is, he has the promises of God. And he's still not trusting God. He's still afraid. Instead of letting God take care of this, he's still afraid. But notice, his sin does not just affect him. In the next verse, we see the rebuke on Sarah. In verse 14, it says, And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and manservants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, notice this phrase, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering, he is clothing of the eyes unto all that are with thee and, and 
with all other. Thus she was reproved. Now that word has kind of a dual meaning, not only to be rebuked or corrected, but also to be made right. So she's restored back to Abraham appropriately. Her reproof was brought on by her husband. His disobedience to God affected her. I would say to us, our disobedience affects more than just us. Men, when we, as husbands, as fathers, when we are disobedient to God, our families pay a price. Now, God judges our family through us, and we, we should, if we're right with God, be paying the higher price, and we're kind of buffering that as it reaches our family. But the shame and the cost, the consequences, are still going to play out. Because even though God happens, and sometimes He steps into our mess and steps into our lives, and He corrects things or He prevents the worst possible scenario from happening, the consequences are still there. The actions, the response, the, the results of our actions or our inactions are still going to be there. He may preserve us from the worst possible scenario, but we're still going to experience the consequences of not following God, of not trusting God, of not honoring God. I'm grateful that God does this. I'm grateful that God sometimes steps in and he stops the worst case scenarios. But even then, he doesn't always. There's a point we get away from God and we decide that, hey, this is working out okay for me. I'll just keep doing this. That God will just allow the natural consequences to occur. And sometimes he allows even the terrible things to happen because sometimes we get so full of ourselves, the only way we can stop and realize we're not in control is for us to reach a place in our life where God puts us at the bottom of the barrel. And if we're smart, we won't keep clawing at the bottom of the barrel to try to see how much lower we can get. We'll stop and look up and realize all the time, all this time, God has been standing waiting for us to say, Father, I'm sorry. Fix me. And we have a beautiful picture in Luke of the prodigal son. And really, this story is the father of the prodigal son, not the prodigal son. The whole emphasis in the story is about a father who loves his son. A father whose son is so rebellious that he comes, he says, just give me everything that's owed me, and he goes out to live his life. But every day the father walks out down the road a ways, and he looks, hoping to see his son coming home one day. Because the father knows, this is my dumb one. He's going to go out and he's going to blow all of his money. He's going to end up in a mess. And one day he's going to come home with his tail between his legs, and I want to be there for him. Not so I can say, I told you so. No, so I can run down here and go, so oh, how bad did you shame the family? But because he knows when that happens, he's going to be embarrassed. He's going to be shamed. He's going to be in need, and he's going to need a loving arm, not a mouthy dad. And as the story goes, we all know the story. He comes to himself in a pig pen, and he realizes everybody, even the servants in his dad's house, have it better. And so he says, I'm just going to go back to dad and be a servant. I'll just come in and say, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. Just take me back as a servant. That's all I ask. And as he's walking back to the house, no doubt rehearsing in his mind how he's going to say this, what he's going to do, dad sees him. And dad takes off from him. And when he gets to him, he grabs him and he pulls him into his arms and he loves him. And when his son says, Dad, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against God, just let me be a servant in your house. That's all I ask. That's his nonsense. Come on. And he tells his servants to kill the fatted lamb. Let's have a celebration because my son was lost. And now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. Let's celebrate. The consequences of the actions didn't go away, did they? And for the rest of his life, he had to live out the embarrassment of what he had done. None of that was ever going to change. But the love of the father was still the same. Even though the father may have been able to stop some of it, he could have told him, no, I'm not going to give you your money. No, I'm not going to do anything. He could have stopped some of it, but he knew nothing would happen with that. Nothing would be learned with that. Nothing would be corrected in his son. He had to go out. He had to go do his thing so he could get to the bottom and realize how, how good he had it and how much he was loved and how much anything he needed was available to him. 
We get so far out from God sometimes, even as children of God. We get to doing things on our own, thinking we can handle it all. And we keep making decisions apart from God. We keep going directions apart from God. We don't stop and ask. And as things start happening, we just get bowed up and we drive harder. Well, if I do this, it'll get better. Well, if I'll do this, it'll get better. And every decision we make is not in line with God. And every decision we make apart from God, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse until one day we realize there's nothing else I can do. And anything I try to do is going to be even worse than this. We find ourselves flat of our back, looking up, going, how in the world did I get here? And hopefully we're smart enough in that moment to look up and go, oh yeah, my decisions. These are the consequences. These are the results of my decisions. If I just had done it God's way. While we're laying there looking up, hopefully we're seeing the face of our Father saying, home. I'm here. I can get you out of the barrel. Just let me take you. Just let me pick you up. I'm going to tell you, I have found myself there and it's the best place to ever be. At the same time, it's the worst place to ever be because it's there and you get a good grasp that I'm not in charge. But God is. If I'll do it His way, if I'll just yield to Him, He'll make this thing okay. Look at the consequences. Verse 17, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and and they bear children. For the Lord hath fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. The shaved Abraham not only has to confess his sin, but now... He has to pray for Abimelech. How embarrassing is that? To be rebuked by God. And now the only way Abimelech can get out from under this curse, God has told him, if you'll do all this, I'll lift the curse. Abraham will pray for you and I'll lift the curse. Abraham now has to go pray for the guy and he's the cause of all of his problems. His son Isaac is going to repeat the same foolishness in the future. And Abraham is diminished in the eyes of those around him. Folks, whether we realize it or not, people watch. They watch us. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. And when we live life and we make mistakes and we surrender to that, we ask God to forgive us and we go on about our business, people will see that we're real, that we're human. But folks, when we talk a Jesus streak, but we live a devil streak, things happen. Consequences come. And those are more profound than just, well, that was a dumb idea. And people look at us and go, "Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, you're always talking Jesus, but you don't live any different than the people I'm working with. And now God has to do some judging. He has to get the whipping stick out and make some big profound things in our life. Our testimony is diminished. Our ability to witness is diminished. I'm not saying it can't be rebuilt. I'm not saying that God can't turn that around and use that eventually. But in the here and now, we're just another two-faced hypocrite that goes up to some church. Folks, we have a couple of responsibilities in life, and one of those is to honor God and to serve God and to tell people about the saving grace of Jesus. But if you get over in James, we get what God's definition of religion is. You see, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to tend to the father, fatherless, uh, the, the widows and the fatherless in their affliction, meaning get down in the affliction with them, in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted by the world. So pure religion before God is not our denomination. Pure religion before God is not the church. Pure religion before God is not having a title, not saying we're a Christian. Pure religion is tending to the widows and the fatherless in their affliction, 
helping them when they are in a nightmare and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. In other words, we are to live above sin in the presence of God. We are to be growing daily in God to where we are farther and farther removed from sin because we are closer and closer to God in our actions. We are less friends with the world and friends with God. It is time that we as Christians stand. Listen, God has given us all sorts of, all sorts of things to help us. He's given us His Holy Spirit to convict us, to teach us, to lead us. He's left us His Word so we can understand how to do this stuff. He's left us His church so we can come together and grow and have strength one with another. He's given us friendship and family in Christ. All these things to help us, to make it easier for us to just simply trust him to do what he said he's going to do. God happens. No matter what's going on in our life, somewhere will be but God. And that could be a rescue, or that could be a rebuke, or it could be both at the same time. Wouldn't it be easier if we just got up in the morning and we gave ourselves to God every morning and said, okay, God, Another day, I'm a, I'm a human, I'm going to mess up. So I need your help. I need your touch. So I'm going to start in prayer, I'm going to start reading. Every morning I get up, I'm going to read, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get the first thing in my mind, not the news, Jesus. The first thought of my mind, the first thing in my heart, not the news, not the animals, not the, the job that I'm about to do, not the schedule, Jesus, first thing on my heart today, first thing on my mind today, Jesus. And throughout the day, every now and then, I'm going to stop. I'm going to plug back in because we all get busy. We all get into doing the things we have to do, our work, our families, our, our properties, or whatever it is that we do, we all do different stuff. We all have things that we do. And if we're not careful, we start out right, but somewhere during the day, we get distracted. And sometimes through the day, we need to stop several times through the day and just plug back in. Maybe in the morning, every morning, you pick a verse that you're just going to ponder all day long. And all throughout the door, you're just going to, you're just going to remind yourself of that verse. I'm busy, and I'm just, you know, and I realize, wow, it's, it's been three hours. I, where has time gone? You know what? Three, let, me, let me just stop for a minute. Father, it's been a busy day today, and, and, I, and I find myself getting a little distracted now. So I just, I just want to recall this verse that you gave me this morning. Say that verse again. Think about what that verse means while you go off to the next part of whatever your day includes. It's really not that hard. The devil's going to fight us. But really and truly, learning to live for God is really not all that hard to learn. Doing it, that's eh, another thing. That's what we call easy preaching, hard living. It's easy to understand it. It's easy to learn that this is what we've got to do. But we're going to face battles, aren't we? And we fight our own flesh. That's why it's so important that we do this throughout the day, over and over, refresh our relationship, how close we are to think about things, to read his Bible. How many of us have a cell phone, have a smartphone? How many of us have a Bible app of some kind on our smartphone? And how many of you are ever away from your smartphone? Wish you could be away from your smartphone? Yeah, that's everybody. So we're, we're really never away, are we? We always have his word, and we always have what we have in our heart. If we will do what the Bible says, hide his word in our heart, even when we don't have a phone, even when the app won't come up, when everything else isn't working, we will still have the Bible that we can recall and ponder and let God do something with. God's there. And God is going to happen in our life. The question is, is that happening going to build us, or is it going to bruise us because we're failing to serve him in the way we should? Have we trusted Christ as our Savior? Because none of this plays well. In fact, none of this really works until we've come to Christ and trusted Him. Only then do we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. Only then does this Bible make sense. This Bible even tells us that people that don't know God who have not been saved, they can't understand the stuff in this book because it's spiritual. 
And it requires the Holy Spirit of God to help us understand those things that are spiritual. Have we trusted Christ as our Savior? The only way to heaven is to trust Jesus and his payment on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection for our sin. That's the only way to be saved. Have we trusted that? Have we asked God to save us through Jesus Christ? The next question is, Christian, do we really get up in the morning with God on our mind? Do we really get up and start our day with his word, start our day with prayer? Or do we jump out of bed and hit whatever it is we got to do? Can I encourage us, if we jump up and we just go straight to whatever's happening, that we learn to get up just a little bit earlier? Just so there's enough time to stop and pray, to read his word. Do you realize the first thing that you read, the first thing that you look at, is what you think about the dominance of the day? So the first thing you do, if you're a early morning and facilities person and you go in and you read the news while you're doing business what you're going to think on all day long is whatever the news was if you'll start your day in this book the primary thought in your mind will be the first thought on your mind it will be jesus can i encourage us if you don't already do that start start your day with jesus christ and see how that changes and see if things don't go a little better than they ever have before Still going to have trouble, still going to have temptation, but the ability to navigate that in a way that is honoring requires us to spend time with Jesus Christ. And that can only happen when we get in this book and we pray. Father, touch us today to do what you want to do, how you want to do. If there's decisions we need to make, if there's something we need to take care of with you, Father, let this be the moment, the hour that we do that. Let this be the time that we say, you know what, I'm not quite where I need to be, and I'm just renewing myself today to get back to where I should be. I'm just going to come home again and say, Father, so I've been, I've been out and away again, and I need you to touch me, I need you to forgive me, I need you to strengthen me and help me in this walk. And then, Father, help us to not be bashful, to turn to our brothers and sisters and say, hey, I'm really struggling in this area. Can you help me? Can you pray with me? Can you be my accountability partner? You put us together here for a reason. And we so often miss the value of what church, what we call church, is all about. We miss the strengthening. We miss the accountability we miss the opportunity to grow and to have close friendships because it becomes a thing. It becomes our tradition. It becomes our resume. You gave us this body to benefit us, to encourage us, to challenge us so that we could be stronger when we go out as your army to fight the good fight, to share the gospel, to preach the truth, to preach grace and freedom. We miss all of that. We turn it into just something else we do. Father, help us that we never elevate the church above your son. But at the same time, we never diminish the church as if it's unimportant, something that is not necessary, something that is not innately valuable and critical to our walk with you, to our daily life with you. You died for your church. If it's that important to you, it ought to be that important to us. Let's help us, Father, see past what all we've made it to see what it is that you created and become more in love with you and become more in love with your church because this is your way this is your stuff right here help us father not to miss the benefits that you give us through the gathering of your people and father we pray if there's any who have not trusted your son 
We pray this is the day they say, Jesus, save me. I am a sinner. And enjoy the freedom of being gloriously saved and redeemed and knowing that redemption is eternal. Father, we love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our